Um, let me just uh, begin by saying that I hope we'll be able to see a full presentation and we'll receive copies of the full presentation. That is already on the monitor, but um, what I will do is to simply speak to uh, the presentation and refer to the slides, uh, a couple of slides, uh, to save time. So at the end of 2019, our economy was looking very good indeed. We had had four quarters of consecutive GDP growth, and all the fundamentals, the macroeconomic fundamentals, looked excellent. And we were well on our way to uh, much faster growth. Then COVID-19 struck. And if we go to slide four, you will see, we can see the devastating impact of COVID-19 on the economy. Uh, GDP contracted to minus 6.10% during the second quarter of 2020. Oil price at one point fell even below production costs, about $10 a barrel, and then finally settled at about $45 a barrel during the second quarter of 2020. The official rate of the Naira was devalued from 305 Naira to the dollar, then to 380 Naira to the dollar. And by the third, this was by the third quarter of 2020. Unemployment went up to 33.3% in the fourth quarter of 2020. And in slide five, you can also see, slide five, you can see uh, there were sharp declines in some key sectors transportation sector declined by 49%, uh, hospitality fell by 40%, uh, the education sector fell by 24%, real estate declined by 22%, trade declined by 17%, and construction by 40%. So clearly we were in a terrible economic situation and all brought upon us by the pandemic. I think it's very important to put in context, you know, just the enormity of the shocks that we experienced. Because even a 5% decline in any sector of the economy is significant. So clearly where you get 40% decline, where you get uh, the, 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 some of that, 49% in transportation, for example, 40% in construction. I mean, that is deep, especially as the country was just pulling out of, 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 an earlier, of an earlier recession. And, and this is also in the context of the security challenges that we're facing in different zones of the country. So the, the total picture at the time was certainly very dire. In response, the president took two actions. The first was to set up a small interministerial committee headed by the Minister of Finance to quickly examine the implications of and the immediate mitigation steps that would be taken for the economic shocks that we were experiencing. The second step which, it, which Mr. President took was to ask that we draw up a full economic sustainability plan to provide at least a 12-month response to the fallout of the pandemic. And Mr. President asked me to chair the committee to draw up the plan and later to implement the plan. We were clear that the only way, and uh, uh, Mr. President's uh, position also, was that the only way of avoiding an economic disaster that could last for years was for government to essentially put forward a major fiscal stimulus plan with clear objectives of saving jobs, creating new ones, supporting businesses that may close down, and employees that may not be paid during the lockdowns, and of course, healthcare support to reduce the COVID-19 caseload. So the objectives of the plan are set out uh, in slide eight. If you look at slide eight, the objectives of the plan are set out there. First, improved healthcare and lowering the COVID-19 uh, caseload. The second was restoring growth. The third, job creation and safeguarding existing jobs. The fourth, increased local production and part of that uh, was what we call the guaranteed offtake scheme. The fifth was reducing social vulnerabilities, and that essentially was looking at how to 
improve the quality and effectiveness of the social investment program and the scope of the program as part of the improving uh, social vulnerabilities. The size of the stimulus or the cost of the plan was 2.3 trillion. And slide 10 will show us how we planned to raise that 2.3 trillion naira. And this was all very carefully worked out. At the Economic Sustainability Committee, we looked very carefully at the different models and what, how much money we thought would be able to get us back into growth and out of recession quickly. And we were assisted by the MBS uh, and, of course, the Ministry of Finance also assisted greatly in setting up a model that could describe to us and tell us as nearly accurate as possible how much will be required to get us out of the, of the recession and, of course, to get us back to a path of sustainable growth. So the sources of funding, after we had decided there was 2.3 trillion, were one from special accounts, 500 billion from special accounts. Now, these special accounts is just a way of describing different government accounts that we thought we could draw from. You know, so essentially what we were doing was wiring money from different government accounts and pulling them into one account so that we could use that as a first, uh, as a first bit of money that we could get in order to finance the 2.3 trillion. Then there was lending from the CBN, structured lending from the CBN to the tune of 1.22 trillion Naira. Now this lending, of course, is completely different from ways and means. This lending was supposed to come through uh, CRR and uh, through the banking system itself. So essentially what we're supposed to do, uh, what we're getting from the CBN was lending, was on lending to banks, which would then be lent to the businesses and, and to the sectors of the economy that we thought would require the lending. Then for multilateral, bilateral and multilateral agencies, another 334 billion and other funding sources, 300 billion. I'll come back to slides 11 and 13 later. So we set up some priority clusters, areas of activity that could be grouped together for planning purposes. And in slide nine, you'll see uh, the priority clusters. So the priority clusters were mitigating the shock. That was a cluster. How do we mitigate the shock, the immediate steps to be taken? Tackling vulnerabilities, which of course is the social investment program. Job intensive interventions, in other words, programs designed to create and sustain jobs, and we'll come to that in a moment. Then rescuing businesses, which was the MSME survival fund, etc. Then repositioning the economy. And we then took uh, also uh, what we described as cross-cutting imperatives for a post-COVID uh, economic recovery. We thought that perhaps it was also an opportunity for us to do certain things or to put certain things in the fore which even after the initial, uh, after, uh, after our initial interventions from the, uh, and uh, getting away from the economic shocks would be required for us to be able to put the economy on a path of sustained growth. The six priority clusters enabled programs to be compartmentalized in buckets with clear targets. So in slide 14, I think it's slide 14, yes, we have some of the fiscal and monetary measures which were taken to help mitigate the impact of the pandemic. So the fiscal measures included <clears throat> the extension of the deadline and suspension of penalties for filing late returns, for example. The conversion of the World Bank $82 million Redisa program to support COVID-19 interventions in the state. So we asked the World Bank to allow us to convert that $82 million uh, program to give individual states money so that they could build, they could build up their healthcare facilities, set up their laboratories and do a few other things that were required as an emergency measure. And the World Bank consented to that, so we were able to uh, distribute the $82 million to the different states. The provision of an $86 billion intervention fund for health infrastructure, and that came directly from our $500 billion from the special accounts. Payment of an incentive package for frontline healthcare workers. That, you know, of course, also came from the 500 billion. 
and then the grant of an additional moratorium of one year on CBN intervention facilities. So, so the CBN intervention facilities that had been given to various businesses, the CBN uh, graciously consented to a reduction uh, for, uh, to a one-year moratorium for payments so that they were then able to defer payment on their loans for at least a year. Of course, that was subsequently extended uh, when uh, we, we found that that would not be adequate. Then there was a reduction in interest rates on intervention facilities which the CBN had given. The CBN gave those intervention facilities at 9%. So there was a reduction as part of the plan to make life easier for businesses to 5%, from 9% to 5%. Then there was also a grant of regulatory forbearance to banks to give borrowers some breathing space, including through restructuring of outstanding debts. In other words, businesses that uh, wanted their loans restructured, businesses that felt that they were no longer able to keep up payments of their loans to banks, the CBN gave a regulatory forbearance, in other words, allowed the banks to be able to look at their, uh, at their, uh, at their loan structures and restructure where that was required. In other words, the CBN uh, granted a forbearance on non-performing loans. So the CBN also, uh, and, some, and these are some of the interventions that the CBN, uh, CBN reports, uh, a disbursement of uh, 3.9 million, uh, uh, million smallholder farms. Uh, this was under the Anchor Borrowers Program, about 789 billion. Uh, the CBN reports were spent on uh, the Anchor Borrowers Program. Now, the Anchor Borrowers Program, of course, was not a part of the Economic Sustainability Plan in that way, but it obviously affected uh, the way that, uh, first of all, the general amounts of money that were released in the system, and of course, was a continuous program, and it flowed also into the Economic Sustainability Plan. There was also another uh, 134.6 billion to 38,140 beneficiaries under the AGS MIS uh, scheme, and uh, 343 billion to 726,158 beneficiaries. And I'm looking here at CBN's own direct interventions. And the release of over a trillion Naira to 269 real sector projects in all. 103 billion disbursed to 110 healthcare projects. Now, these, uh, of course, are the CBN's own releases, uh, CBN's own interventions. Some of the fiscal measures uh, have been taken to save, or was taken to safeguard all revenues, mobilized and preserve non-oil revenues, and rationalize government expenditure. These were steps taken essentially by the uh, Ministry of Finance. But a major component of the plan was, of course, to build a resilient healthcare system. And this remains a critical objective of the, uh, as the pandemic, of course, is still raging. So if you look at slide 15, the funds allocated to the health sector were for surveillance and epidemiology, establishing laboratories, point of entry management, infection prevention and control, case management, health-related communications, research and development. And after full implementation, what we expect to see, although already we've seen several of these, 52 federal tertiary health institutions, the availability of PPEs in all federal tertiary institutions, 520 ICU beds, 52 isolation wards with 1,040 beds, 52 molecular laboratories, to carry out, on the average, 150 PCR tests every day. I think it's important to point out that these are federal government interventions. These are not state interventions. Of course, the states were also building up their own capacity. But what I've just described are the federal government's own specific interventions and the results of those interventions. Of course, we know that vaccines are being administered across the 36 states of Nigeria today. And as of 28 September 2021, 4.8 million people, or 4.3% of the eligible population, had received the first dose of vaccines. 1.9 million people, or about 1.8 of the eligible population, have received the second dose. 
We've already received and we're also expecting significant quantities of vaccines in the coming weeks and months. So I'll go now to the MSME Survival Fund. And as I noted earlier, one of the important things that we considered was rescuing businesses, keeping businesses afloat. And the particular program that was designed for that was designed by the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, and was described as the MSME Survival Fund. And if you go to slide 16, if you go to slide 16, this is uh, the, 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 the layout of the program. Now, the programs were designed to create and safeguard existing jobs. So we have the guaranteed offtake uh, scheme, the payroll support scheme, the artisan and transport support scheme, the general MSME grant, and then formalization of uh, companies support scheme. The MSME programs had uh, in all, as of today, supported 1.1 million people and businesses as follows. Direct grants were given for a three month period to 459 beneficiaries across the country. In other words, salaries of 449,000 people were paid for a three month period. We had representations from several uh, sectors for example, teachers, private school teachers, were, uh, there was, there, there's an association of private school teachers. They were very uh, interested in ensuring that, their, that teachers remain paid during the period. Of course, public school teachers were being paid, but private school teachers also uh, wanted to be paid. So they formed a significant portion of the 459,000 uh, of those who were uh, paid mm -hmm. as, part of that, uh, as part of that fund. And, these, of course, were persons who then received between 90,000 and 150,000 in salaries for the three month period. Then 293,000 transport workers and artisans received a one off grant of 30,000 30, naira each. 293,000, these were artisans and transport workers. They received a one off grant of 30,000 naira. Then from the MSME general grants, 82,000 businesses also received one of grants, 82,000 businesses. And then uh, 255,000 enterprises benefited from the CAC free registration of company scheme. This was called the formalization scheme. So what simply happened here was that if companies, uh, persons who wanted to register their companies, 255,000 of them were allowed to register those companies free. And so the, in, in effect, the federal government paid for the registration of those companies. Then uh, we have the Agric and uh, the Agric program. We called it Agriculture for Food and Jobs, the Agriculture for Food and Jobs Plan. And this is in slide 17. And this is also a very major pillar of the plan because we thought that mass agriculture, putting, doing something extra for agriculture would provide jobs and food. So, uh, part of that program was the enumeration of farmers. And we enumerated 6.39 million farmers, and these farmers were geotagged to their land. So you could actually, so today we have ac accurate records verified by the Ministry of Communications and Digital Te uh, Technology, accurate records of 6.39 million farmers with their farmlands actually geotagged. So we know exactly where their farms are, we know exactly where they were. And uh, so far, 363 million passed the first stage of validation, and another 2.47 million passed the second stage of validation. Now we're validating them also for, and also BVNs, they are being, uh, those who do not have BVNs are getting BVNs and all of that. 320 hectares of land, 320 hectares of land, has been cleared across eight states at 40 hectares per state. Now, there are several states, of course, that are involved in the project. The states are Quara, Plateau, uh, Cross River, Edo, Kaduna, uh, Ekiti, and Oshun states. These are states that require land clearing. Of course, many states do not require land clearing, and we simply support those states directly. 447 billion naira is allocated as loans to farmers across 14 crop value chains, beef production, aquaculture, and poultry farming. But so far, only 14 billion has been disbursed to commercial banks. 
And even this storm is yet to be utilized by farmers due to the late release for the 2021 wet farming season. And I'll come to that in a moment because we've had some complications, especially with the structured loans that we're supposed to get coming from the CBN to the commercial banks. Then we have the fertilizer subsidy program, which is a very important and critical part of this uh, food for jobs program. Because uh, prior, uh, what has happened is that fertilizer has always been a problem and uh, paying for fertilizer and all of that has always been a problem and being able to assist farmers. But this program was designed and Mr. President approved a program of giving subsidies to uh, the, to, to uh, farmers for bags of fertilizer to each uh, farmer, and depending on the size of the uh, de depending on the size of the farm. But the strategy here was to give the farmer the amount of the subsidy directly in cash, paid to their BVN verified account. So each farmer that was going to get a subsidy would have this money paid directly to his BVN uh, verified account. And Mr. President approved the disbursement of the fertilizer subsidy fund to smallholder vulnerable farmers in the country. A subsidy of 5.1 billion was paid to 1.1 uh, million uh, uh, 13,126 farmers. This is lower than previously reported uh, due to the removal of about 184,000 of them who did not have uh, BVN verified accounts at the time. But the subsidy payment is an evidence-based payment tied to farmer enumeration. So a farmer receives four bags of MPK per hectare. So a farmer with five uh, acres or two hectares gets a subsidy of 24,000 Naira paid directly to his account for the eight bags of MPK that will be needed. A farmer who owns one acre or less gets a subsidy of 3,000 Naira. And as I said, this is paid directly to, uh, to the farmers. So that, that has helped a great deal in ensuring that subsidies actually get to the farmers and they are able to benefit directly from the subsidies. So when they buy, uh, they, and they can go anywhere, of course, to buy their, uh, to buy their, uh, their MPK, which is, already very, which is already available. But rather than relying on sellers or relying on third parties or anybody to provide that subsidy, they already have the subsidy. So when they go and buy, they are, they are already at either 3,000, between 3,000 and 24,000 in, uh, in credit. The next is the social housing program. Now the social housing program was also designed to create thousands of jobs and boost the local building materials industry. The whole idea was to build 300,000 houses and uh, so far, we, we have uh, over 1,151 hectares of land. This has been made ready for development. And this has the capacity to accommodate about 34,550 homes. The program is funded by a mix of resources. And I think this is also uh, a point that I'll, uh, I'll come back to. It includes financing from the Federal Ministry of Finance under uh, the Social Investment Program the Family Homes Fund, and a loan from the central bank under the Economic Sustainability Plan, which is supposed to be in the order of about 200 billion Naira. Buyers have a window of at least 15 years to pay for their homes. The design is to build two bedroom homes costing not more than 2 million Naira. So if you're going to buy uh, the three bedroom homes, it'd be 3.75 million and 4.25 million for a four, four room unit. But the cheapest is a two million Naira home. And at first, you know, of course there were very many arguments. It wasn't possible to build a home for two million. But we've not only tested it, we've built it. As a matter of fact, Bono State now has 8,000 such units. They are way ahead of others. They built 8,000 units of, of these homes. And the homes are specifically designed to meet the cultural needs of, place, of the places where they are built. So in Bono, for example, the, the, the way that the houses are structured is completely different from the way that they are structured in Nasarawa State, for example. You know, and I think that uh, the Bono State has set you know, a, an example and shown that it is entirely possible. 
to do this to, and to build very, very quickly using local raw materials, using uh, local artisans, and of course, uh, doing so at, at great speed. At the moment also, 4,700 homes have been approved in seven states for financing for commencement in October. Another 5,400 are scheduled for commencement in November of this year. Progress has been much slower than envisaged. There are continuing delays in disbursement of funds uh, between the CBN and the commercial banks. We've had uh, serious delays. Now, the debenture agreement for the sum of 200 billion, because we had to go into a debenture agreement with the CBN in order to be able to ensure that these funds were not just dissipated and there'll be no uh, possibility of paying back. But of course, the CBN's loan represents the largest uh, bulk of the financing. But we've signed the debenture agreement since April, and of course, we're still waiting for disbursements to fully commence. Solar electrification program is, a, is another limb of this uh, uh, creation of jobs and at the same time adding value to the quality of lives of the people. So the solar electrification scheme, and this is in slide 19, is designed to create several jobs and develop a local solar industry, even as it increases energy access across 5 million new solar connections. It will include the assembly of, and manufacturing of components of off-grid solutions to facilitate the growth of the local manufacturing industry, while the use of local content will be encouraged. And we expect that in all, it should create 250,000 new jobs in the energy sector. For funding purposes, the program has been broken to five categories, 57 billion Naira, in guarantor projects. In other words, uh, we're asking some of the federal government agencies, the NDPHC, the NMPC, to guarantee certain portions of, of, uh, of the whole program. And so far, we have guarantees from the, N, uh, from the NMPC and also from the NDPHC. So we're, and those guarantees are worth 57 billion. In, in effect, the, the producers, uh, the installers of the solar connections can go ahead and connect 57 billion Naira worth of solar products upon the guarantees of these two uh, agencies. Then there's a 20 billion in small scale downstream, 20 billion in commercial bank upstream projects. These are all projects supported by the commercial banks. And then 28 billion for state guaranteed projects. Adamawa, Akwa Ebon states, for example, are guaranteeing their own projects to the tune of about 28 billion. And 15 billion in commercial bank downstream projects. Now, when I say a um, guarantee, of course, they are not putting cash on the table, but they are placing guarantees with commercial banks to say that if money is not paid back, if they are not able to get money back, then they run, uh, then, then they, of course, are the primary obligors. Now, the way that this works is that each solar connection is not a free gift because it is installed by a private solar company. And what happens is that where a solar connection is made, the recipient of the solar connection also makes payments on a, on a monthly basis. And what we found across the country is that so long as power is steady and power is steady, everyone is required to pay. The rate of default is almost, is, is almost zero. Everybody is prepared to pay so long as there's power. And we had experimented with this uh, previously in several market settings, for example. We experimented with it in the Sabongari market, in the area, area market, where we had uh, thousands of, of, of um, stalls installed with solar power, and every one of them, there's just absolutely no rate of default. In any event, if you default, your, uh, your connection is cut off. So it's a very effective program, and everyone, and, and those who, uh, who have benefited from it are extremely uh, happy with it, and it is, it is also a sustainable uh, program. Unfortunately, again, funds have been very slow in coming. Uh, we've had difficulties with accessing 
most of the funds uh, because, again, as I've said, these are CBN to commercial banks and commercial banks uh, to, uh, to the uh, private companies that have to do this. Uh, of the 140 billion that we're supposed to receive, so far we've received only 7 billion. That's only 7 billion naira has been disbursed. Although we have 42 billion worth of transactions have been fully closed and uh, fully deployed, and we're just waiting for that to happen, which will lead to 704,000 connections. A further 46 billion in transactions are in very advanced stages, and that will lead to another 600,000 in connections. We expect that in the uh, next coming weeks and months, we'll be able to move very quickly on the solar uh, connections as uh, the uh, banks get more, uh, as the banks are able to get more uh, confident to be able to give those uh, funds which uh, the CBN is supposed to is supposed to guarantee. The key challenges, of course, are the problems, as I've said, with uh, disbursements coming from the CBN to the commercial banks and to the users of the funds. Then there's also a risk aversion of public and private financial institutions, particularly for power projects, uh, in addition to a limited knowledge of the off-grid market and its potential. But I think that over time, we're working through this, and I'm, I'm very confident that we'll be able to get to a point where everyone is able to deal, uh, is able to be, have more confidence in the whole process and be sure that their money will come back when they give uh, the money. Lack of access to foreign exchange for the importation of systems and raw materials is also another major problem. Then we have the public works and aviation segments of the plan. And if you go to slide 20, uh, we have um, all of what is going on in the public works program. About 193 uh, road sections, totaling 3,707 kilometers of roads is going on at the moment. 26,021 Nigerians have been employed in rehabilitation and construction of these roads so far. And there's also the construction of 345 kilometers of rural roads 205 boreholes and 10 treatment plants to create jobs and develop rural areas. I think it's important to understand that the public works program is also one of those programs that was designed to create jobs in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, to sustain those who, uh, of course, will be unable for one reason or the other to, uh, to, uh, to, to handle their lives or to feed themselves during that period. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of benefit was derived from that. As a matter of fact, the Honorable Minister of State for Budget and National Planning went around looking at several of these public works projects and sent back um, live photographs and videos showing uh, the very uh, uh, tremendous amount of work that had been done and the number of people who had been engaged. So in the 36 states and the FCT uh, also, uh, Already road construction is at 98% completion with 204 kilometers completed. 774,000 young people have been engaged by the National Directorate of Employment, the NDE. And in the public works program, uh, uh, that's in the public works program. In aviation, uh, the uh, five billion was allocated for local airlines, for ground handlers and other aviation allied businesses aimed at easing the negative economic effects of the pandemic. And the breakdown, I think we have a, a, a good account of the breakdown. Uh, scheduled operators got 2.84 billion. Non-scheduled operators, cargo and private jet services got 944 million. Ground operators about 233 billion. In-flight catering services about 233 billion, uh, 233 million, beg your pardon. Aviation fuel operators, 233 million. And travel agents, another 196 million. Airport hire, also 196 million. What are the outcomes of the plan so far? You know, and um, I, of course, uh, if you look at the details, if you look at the total, the full presentation, there's so many details, and I'm not going to be able to go into all those details. So I'll just skip uh, quite a few of the details, and then just go to the outcomes of the plan so far. 
I think it's fair to say that the plan has helped uh, to avoid a much more painful economic challenge. And I think that uh, we must commend uh, Mr. President for his foresight and for acting quickly. I think that's the most important part of this, acting very quickly. First of all, in setting up that small committee to assess uh, the, the damage and then very quickly going on to the establishment of the Economic Sustainability Plan and having a detailed plan with funding and then approving that plan also expeditiously so that uh, we're able to move quickly uh, and but for the speed with which uh, this was done, things would of course have been very, very, very bad and much worse. And I think it enabled us, as we've heard, to get out of the recession in record time and much faster than most economies of the world. As a matter of fact, you'll find that most economies of the world were scrambling, uh, trying to find one solution or the other, trying to determine what a fiscal sustainability plan would look like and all of that. But uh, I think that um, we were able to move very, very quickly under the direction and leadership of Mr. President, and able to put in, uh, together a plan act, uh, and act on the plan as quickly as we were able to. Now, slide 12 describes some of the specific outcomes. Uh, revenues, of course, improved despite all production issues. But macro indices are also trending in the right direction today. And of course, if you've looked at uh, our GDP report, you'll find that definitely uh, things are looking up. Revenues year on year, uh, Federation revenues in Q2 2021 are up by 6%, although much lower than projected in the budget due to problems with production, uh, with oil production. We are producing less than our, our OPEC quotas. And of course, I'm sure that when you have the presentation from Ministry of uh, petroleum, there will also be some additional insights into that, you know, shutdowns uh, or shut-ins in uh, some of the wells and the various problems of getting them back up have generally tended to reduce our revenues, as you will see in the GDP report. Inflation has trended downward over the past five months, falling to about 17% during the second quarter of this year, although food inflation, as you know, is still very troubling and food production and supply has been affected by security challenges. GDP growth uh, performance in the second quarter of this year has been uh, a highlight with an increase of 5% year on year, the highest uh, since uh, 2015. And I think that this is certainly worth uh, celebrating. External reserves, uh, external reserves are also improving, uh, but will, it will be much higher, of course, uh, as we go along, uh, and uh, the, of course the questions around ensuring that we're able to get uh, supply of dollars, and again, we all have our views on, on that, uh, and I might mention, say a thing or two about that. Uh, the, uh, of course, the over, uh, oversubscribed euro bond uh, this last uh, cycle has helped a great deal also in beefing up external reserves. However, given the record high oil prices, the reserves obviously should do better, you know, uh, and I'm sure that they are, w w those are issues that will be examined in greater detail. Slide 13 shows the sectors that have rebounded to positive growth. Uh, transportation has rebounded to positive growth, 77%. Hospitality, 2%, you know, and that's from negative. Real estate from 40% uh, down to 4%. Trade uh, from about 17% down now to 23%. Construction from 40% down to 4% now. I'll just end uh, the discussion of the, uh, of the challenge with, uh, or I'll just end this discussion with some of the challenges of uh, implementing the Economic Sustainability Plan and just a quick look at future perspectives and funding. With respect to full implementation of the plan, we have seen, you know, of course, that inadequate uh, funding has in some ways hampered uh, what could have obviously been a much, much better performance. Our 500 billion, which uh, was budgeted for and which we took from special accounts, was essentially the major part 
of the 2.3 trillion program, the major part of it. Of course, CBN interventions also were very helpful, but I want to just point out that the 1.2 trillion, which is supposed to be structured loans, were still very far behind, and that's a significant part of the plan. So that has greatly affected uh, what would have been an even better uh, outcome. The last GDP report uh, presented by the Honorable Minister of Finance also highlighted major challenges to the economy. Of course, unemployment heading for uh, over almost 40 percent and loss of jobs since 2018, dwindling oil revenues, you know, and um, dwindling on account of production. Uh, poor foreign investment inflows, both FDI and FBIs, likely due to exchange rate concerns and uncertainty around the repatriation of profits and security concerns. Now, I think that many of these problems are completely resolvable. I do not think that they constitute any significant, uh, I don't think that they constitute any significant uh, difficulty that we cannot resolve. But I think that one of the most important things is that there must be synergy between the fiscal and the monetary authority. That is absolutely crucial. We, have, we, we must be able to deal with, uh, with, our, with, with the synergy. We must handle that synergy between, uh, between the monetary authority, the CBN, and the fiscal side. Sometimes it appears that there is uh, competition between this, uh, especially on the fiscal side. If you, look at some of the, if you look at some of the interventions, you'll find that those interventions, they are interventions that should be managed by ministries. So the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment should handle MSME interventions and those kinds of interventions. And we should know what the CBN is doing. In other words, if the CBN is going to intervene in the MSME sector, it should be with the full uh, cooperation and consent of the Ministry of Industries. If they're going to intervene in agriculture, it should be with full consent. So that synergy is absolutely important. The reason why it's important, aside from the fact that you cannot plan an economy in any other way, the more important thing is that sometimes you will get people who are benefiting more than once because we simply have no line of sight to what, uh, uh, what's going on on one side. CBN doesn't know what we're doing. They don't know what, um, uh, they don't know what, uh, uh, we don't know what they're doing. So I think that is important. That synergy is absolutely important. And as for the exchange rate, I think we need to move our rates uh, to a more reflective market, as, uh, more, as reflective of market as possible. This, in my own respectful view, is the only way to improve supply. We can't get new dollars into the system where the exchange rate is artificially low. And everyone knows by how much our reserves can grow. So I'm convinced that the demand management strategy currently being adopted by the CBN, needs, we need to rethink. Uh, and that's just my view. About that. But anyway, all that is, um, all those are issues I'm sure that when the CBN governor has time to address, we'll be able to, he'll be able to address in full. But let me say uh, that uh, on the whole, we, uh, the, we, we have been able to weather the storm of a very, very serious uh, economic uh, challenge. And I think that um, that is largely on account of the stable and steady leadership that we received from Mr. President. I think that if you panic, uh, if Mr. President had panicked in the in that period, we would have had a lot of difficulty. In fact, perhaps we would be in, we would be in a much, much worse situation. And uh, I think that he, he deserves all the commendation for providing that steady hand when that was, was required. As I said, all told, <laughs> as I said, all told, I think that we're at a, I think that we are at, uh, a point in, in, uh, in our economic uh, history where everything is possible. Everything is possible. And I'm completely convinced that, we'll, that even the challenges that we see today are challenges that, will be, that can be resolved very, very easily, so long as we're all prepared to work together towards the same objectives. Thank you very much.